رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, We had mentioned uh, in our last few lessons some of the early incidents that occurred in the life of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina and also the famous uh, treaty or the, the, the uh, uh, Sahifa it's called or the Constitution and we now move on to uh, the incidents that occurred before the great battle of Badr so this is a prelude basically to the battle of Badr now today we'll talk about a number of important changes in the Madani society of course the Prophet ﷺ had moved to a new place it's a new era everything is different and so a number of different policies were put into place that were new and impossible to implement in Mecca today we'll discuss three of them uh, two of them briefly, one of them in detail. The first is the economic policies, the second is spiritual developments, and the third is political developments. These are the three primary uh, things that we're going to discuss today. Number one, economic policies. In Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ was a minority. He could not have an independent economic policy. He could not have, have a separate economic system. However, in Medina, of course, the Prophet ﷺ is now independent, and he now has his own uh, if you like uh, his own uh, independence, he's not going to be dictated by other people what needs to be done. And therefore, one of the first things that the Prophet ﷺ did when he came to Medina, he visited the other souks of Medina. In those times, the Arabs, the Ansar we call them, primarily were involved in cultivation. They were not generally people that much of business. And if they wanted to do business, they would go to the souks of the Yahud. The Jewish tribes had the biggest souks outside of Medina. And the, uh, what we now call the Ansar, of course, at the time they weren't Ansar, this is pre-Hijrah. Pre the Arabs of Medina did not have a major souk inside the city. The major souks were outside the city, basically in the encampments of the Yehudi tribes. And there were more than one major souk, but outside of the center of Medina. So the Prophet ﷺ visited those souks, and this is reported in Sunan Ibn Majah, and he disapproved of the practices, the cheating, uh, or the deception, he disapproved of what's going on, and he said to the Muslims, this is not a souk for you. This is not a marketplace for you. And he went back to the masjid, and with his own feet, he demarcated lines in the sand. He literally put a line, and then another, and another, and he said, this shall be your souk. And he instituted a souq towards the west of the masjid. Walking distance from the masjid towards the west of the masjid, he demarcated the lines of the souq and he said, this shall be your souq, so let it not be diminished and let no one tax the people in it. He gave two simple rules. Number one, this shall be the demarcated line. No one should encroach any houses, anything else. No, this is a souq now. Number two, no extra taxes. No one is going to be having to pay a penalty or you have to pay a fee to be in the souq. You see, the Prophet's uh, policies for the economic system are very different. And it is not true, by the way. Some people say that Islam promotes a capitalist system. This is not perfectly true. No doubt if you compare socialism, communism, capitalism, these are the three main isms of the 20th and 21st century. If you were forced to compare, the Islamic system comes the closest. But there are many differences, many differences, and it's not fair to say that Islam is a ism. Islam is its own system. And so the Prophet ﷺ instituted a whole new philosophy of economics, if you like, that was unprecedented at the time. And of course, this is a whole different tangent which we don't have time to talk about. What new policies did the Prophet ﷺ bring? This is many different books and many different uh, topics can be written. As you all know, he banned uh, the practice of interest. Well, one of the most important things he did, he linked buying and trading to religiosity, to spirituality. He praised honesty and he criticized dishonesty and he said that the righteous businessmen will be uh, blessed on the day of judgment. He said that those who cheat and lie is not of us. So he linked religiosity and commerce together, right? And anybody who understands the modern economic system will realize that if you don't have ethics, if you don't have principle and morals, you can do whatever you want. It is the only thing that's preventing you from abusing your power or your wealth over other people is an inner conscience. And the Prophet ﷺ linked commerce with trade with a religiosity and he encouraged practices first and foremost that are spiritual in nature and then of course he also uh, demanded a certain code of conduct 
For example, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu forbade uh, cheating and lying, swearing false oaths. He forbade hiding defects. So, and he used to monitor himself. He would walk in the suqs that he instituted. And he once found the famous hadith in Bukhari. He found a date seller who had good quality dates at the top of the bag. But the Prophet ﷺ knew, Jubil told him what's inside. He put his hand inside and he pulled out rotting dates. Because he wanted to sell the bag, and the bag, the top of the dates has the fresh dates, right? So he says, buy the bag for 10 dinars, whatever. So he's going to close the bag and then sell it. But the bottom of the bag was rotting or not good quality. And the Prophet ﷺ uh, said to him, whoever cheats us is not of us. You're going to cheat us, you're not of us. Meaning you're not a, uh, uh, a Muslim who's doing the minimum that you're required to do. We explain what does it mean he's not of us in other uh, lectures of theology. Also the Prophet ﷺ forbade many things. He forbade uh, even something that sounds so innocent, but there's a wisdom behind this. He forbade anybody living in Medina to act as an agent for a Bedouin who comes. Let the Bedouin go to the market and buy and sell himself. Why? Because when you have an agent who lives in the city, he will know the ins and outs, and he will inflate or deflate, and he's going to play the game. Whereas the Bedouin will go and he's going to give fair price. What do I want for my product? I don't care if you guys are charging 20 times more, I'm satisfied with whatever is the amount. Right? So the Prophet forbade a Madani living in Medina to be the simsar or the, 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 the agent or the middleman for the one coming from outside. Let the man come and sell on his own. Right? Because he knows this is one of the biggest tactics or tricks that you don't know anything and so the middleman gets a big cut and the poor Bedouin will get nothing. And subhanAllah, look at how modern economics works. Is that most of the profit, so much profit goes to people who don't do much. But they simply uh, have the cunningness, right? And the Prophet forbade this. He could let the person sell. And many other practices, we don't have time to get into that. But very early on, the Prophet rejected the aswaq that were there. And he established his own suq with his own Islamic, of course, uh, 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 Islamic sharia, of course, being fulfilled there. And of course, this suq flourished. And therefore, when the Jewish tribes were expelled one by one and their suqs obviously collapsed, by the time they were expelled, there was, we didn't, they didn't care about them because they had their own independent suq up and running. So, financial independence. The Prophet ﷺ stressed it from day one. Such that when other economies collapsed, it didn't affect the economy of Medina. Right? Big lesson for us to learn in the modern world. Uh, also spiritual practices, and we're going to talk about this again later on, but just to summarize, as soon as the Prophet ﷺ immigrated, one by one the major commandments came down. Within a year, pretty much the entire sharia of ibadat had been revealed. Within a year, pretty much all of the arkan of Islam, except for hajj. Hajj could not be revealed because you can't do hajj, because hajj is enemy territory, right? So hajj is revealed, ninth year of the hijrah, Abu Bakr goes and does it, tenth year, the Prophet ﷺ does it. Hajj was delayed. But the other pillars, within, uh, so the Prophet ﷺ emigrated, we call this the first year of the hijrah, of course, and we said it was most likely early Rabi' al-Awwal, he arrived in Medina, or late Safar, uh, the date is obviously exactly unknown, but roughly we said. So, Muharram of that year is gone. That Ramadan, nothing happened. The Ramadan of the year of immigration, nothing happened. There is no sharia for fasting. Next Muharram, so nine, ten months after the hijrah. Next Muharram, on the 10th of Muharram, the Prophet ﷺ made the fast of the 10th of Muharram wajib. So for the first year after the hijrah, i.e. second hijrah, the 10th of Muharram was wajib to fast as the stepping stone. Of course, we now know it's not wajib. The 10th of Muharram was wajib to fast. And the Prophet ﷺ made a decree that whoever uh, ate in breakfast in the morning, let him not eat for the rest of the day. Today is going to be wajib to fast. So the first obligatory fast was the stepping stone. One day only. Let them get used to it. Then that Ramadan, Ramadan of the second year, that Ramadan, Allah Azza wa revealed in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, the verse that we recite, right? Shahru Ramadan ladhi unzil fil Quran. Fama shahida minkum shahra fal yasumhu. Whoever is present in the month, i.e. he's not traveling, then he should fast that month, right? And some scholars say even the first Ramadan was encouraged, Allah knows best, but it wasn't made wajib for sure. By unanimous consensus, it was made wajib the second year of the Hijrah, right? The second year of the Hijrah. And at that point in time, the 10th Muharram became Sunnah. So Ramadan becomes wajib, 10th Muharram then becomes Sunnah for the next year. In Ramadan, Zakatul Fitr is revealed. 
And zakat al-fitr, as you know, is the easier of the zakat. Yani in our days is $10, right? $10 is the uh, average. And wallah, even if somebody says 7 or $8, it, it, to be brutally honest, this is not going to be wrong. But yeah, Allah, everybody can afford inshallah $10. So we say $10 in North America, but it's even less than this. So this zakat is just a food, right? One person's food which is a happy meal or something like this that you get. Whatever as an average meal you can get it, right? You give it to a person, this is what the zakat al-fitr is. So, this was the first zakat. Again, to make them used to the concept of zakat. Within a few months, the same year, zakat came down. Zakat al-mal, right? So from zakat al-fitr, then zakat al-mal, right? So they're getting used to it. One, Ramadan, uh, one uh, fast and then the fast of Ramadan. One zakat al-fitr and then the zakat itself. And uh, obviously, uh, at this point in time, of course, the, uh, the basic rulings of the salah are now perfected. The Prophet said, pray as you have seen me pray. Uh, in Mecca, all of the salah were two rak'at. We said when he moved to Medina, then uh, Dhuhr and Asr and uh, Maghrib and Isha were all extended. And only Fajr remained two rak'at. Otherwise, in Mecca, all salawat were two rak'at, all of them. And then when he came to Medina, the salawat are perfected. How you do it, how you do tahara, all of these laws came down. How you do wudu, uh, the laws of Janaba and Ghusr, all of this came down within these first uh, two years, i.e. by the time the second Ramadan finishes, all of these uh, laws have been ordained. And uh, inshallah we'll talk about this, the spiritual development as well later on. But again, realize a lot is happening in Medina. Economic development, spiritual development, the primary thrust of today's topic will be uh, political and military developments. This is now a whole new different ballpark. We have not discussed this in Medina because of course in Medina there are no military developments. In Medina the Muslims are told turn the other cheek. In Medina فَأَعْرِضْ عَنْهُمْ Turn away from them. In Medina فَاصْبِرْ صَبَرًا جميلة. Right? In Medina whatever they do to you tawakkal عَلَى الله. You can't do anything. I'm sorry I'm saying Medina all this time nobody's correcting me. Six times I said it. In Mecca. In Mecca, nothing is, in fact, the Prophet never once did anything military in Mecca. Not one incident, right? Despite the fact that the Sahaba are literally being, some of them, torn to shreds. Like Yasir and like Sumayyah, right? Like Bilal being dragged in the streets of Medina. There is nothing there. Mecca, again, Mecca. My, my mind is tuned to Medina, so I'm always saying Medina here. Bilal is being dragged in the streets of Mecca. And subhanAllah, Think about it, technically, the Prophet could have told one of the Sahaba, go and kill Umayyah ibn Khalaf. Quietly at night, go do it. It's not impossible to do. But the Prophet understands the repercussions. He understands that this is not the right way to do things. That one needs to think 10 steps ahead and not just one step ahead. Even if Bilal is suffering, to kill Umayyah ibn Khalaf is going to bring about so much persecution the Ummah cannot bear it now. So the suffering of one has to be allowed to prevent the suffering of the majority. And this is a lot of wisdom for us to think about in any situation. That one looks at the overall, in Arabic is called masalih and mafasid, the pros and the cons. One weighs the benefits and the negatives, right? And in fact, in this early stage, some people wanted to fight. Especially the young, it's always the young who have the, the, the zealousness to fight. And Allah Azza wa Jal criticized them for wanting to fight in this stage. Allah says in the Quran, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِينَ قِيلَ لَهُمْ كُفُّوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ Don't you see those people who were told in the, states of, in the days of Mecca, كُفُّوا أَيْدِيَكُمْ Which really means lower your hands, stop your hands. Don't do anything physical. Right now, just pray and give charity, whatever you can do. By the way, every reference to zakah in the Meccan era is nafil zakah, right? Every reference, because of course, we said before, the major rulings of ethics were revealed in Mecca, right? Allah Azza wa Jalla said, be good to the orphan. Allah Azza wa Jalla said that, uh, that give food to the uh, masakeen, the yatama, uh, to, the, to the prisoners of war. So these general rulings of ethics are coming, but no laws, uh, specific laws are being revealed other than to pray uh, the, the two rak'at, as we said, uh, five times a day. Now, uh, therefore, in Mecca, the Prophet ﷺ is told to tell the people, lower your hands, kuffu aidiyakum, don't fight. 
zakah. Just concentrate on spirituality. Pray and give zakah. Then Allah says, فَلَمَّا كُتِبَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْقِتَالِ the same people who were bursting to fight, when Allah finally gave them permission, all of a sudden they bulked. All of a sudden they got scared. Whoa, really? Fight? Blood? This is a group of, young, of the youngsters amongst them. And this shows us that those who talk the loudest act the least. Right? Those who have the most grandiose, you know, Criticisms or whatnot, in reality, they do the least. And Allah Azza wa Jal criticizes this group. That, and the same, of course, uh, happened pre previously in the Bani Israel. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions this. But this verse is about some of those who wanted to expedite the fighting. And then when it actually came, they were a bit hesitant. So Allah Azza wa Jal chastised them. Now you're hesitant? When I'm giving you permission and I'm telling you, now you become hesitant? Where was your enthusiasm? Where has it gone now? Right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticized this and of course Allah then revealed verses that allowed uh, jihad and qital. Now, before we move on, we live in a time where every word of a person's and a scholar's is now reinterpreted and misinterpreted and cut and pasted. So we have to be very clear here. When we talk about jihad and qital, we're talking about the historical realities of what happened in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We're obviously uh, being very historic in nature. We're, not, uh, we're being descriptive and not prescriptive. We're talking about the past. We're not talking about the present. And of course, we're not intending that any type of uh, terrorism or anything like this be done. This is a mere historical lesson that we're talking about in the context of the seerah. And this disclaimer has to be given because of uh, the, the perilous times that we live in, where people are locked up merely for saying things that uh, are taken out of context. So we're very clear about this. And alhamdulillah, my message has always been very clear. We criticize those worthy of criticism. And that criticism doesn't take us on the path of incorrect militancy. Now, the first ayah that was revealed about jihad, the first ayah that was revealed about jihad really underscores the philosophy of why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow jihad? Why is Allah allowing military fighting? And that is uh, in Surah Al-Hajj, verses 39 to 41. This is the first concession for jihad. Surah Al-Hajj, verses 39 to 41. Allah says, أُذِنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَإِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَىٰ نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ Permission is given. Permission. Which means that jihad is not the most important thing of Islam. Permission has been given. Permission. There's a big difference. There's an udhina. You wanted to fight, now I'm giving you permission. Before I had withheld you. Right? Because that's the point. Before Allah had withheld them. Udhina. Now I'm giving you permission. Who? لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا because they have been wronged, they are being given permission to fight. Notice, fighting is done for those or on behalf of those who have been wronged against the oppressors. And no nation or no tribunal or no law would not recognize this type of fighting. Oppressed people, people whose rights have been taken away, people whose rights are trampled over, what else are they going to do if the only medium to get those rights back is to fight? Then that is what they are permitted to do. And Allah is capable of protecting them. Those who were kicked out of their houses, the only reason being, because they said our Lord is Allah. Notice the philosophy or the, the, uh, the, the, the reasoning of jihad is very clear. They wanted to kill you. They kicked you out of your houses. They confiscated your property. Now I'm giving you permission to fight back. Notice this. Wallah, it's so clear. Anybody who accuses Islam of being a militant or terrorist religion, this is the first verse of jihad. Because they have kicked you out of your houses and stolen your property and persecuted you only for your belief. We're giving you permission to go back and fight them. Now, any society on earth would justify and would accept this as being a just cause. Subhanallah, this country of ours that we live in, it went to war because they raised the taxes on tea. Okay? And that's why they killed the redcoats, because they didn't want to pay taxes on tea. If that is a worthy cause, then wallahi, this cause is a million times, a billion times more worthy. That we're not going to allow you to persecute us and kill us and take our property and lives away just because we say, Rabbunallah. 
And Allah says, again this is in the same verses, وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضِ Were it not for the fact that Allah allows war where people fight other people, لَفَسَدَتِ الْأَرْضِ The world would go to chaos. You need to have people stand up and fight the truth. And everybody, even pacifists, need to understand, if people didn't oppose Hitler in World War II, the world would be a fascist state now. We needed to stand up and oppose Hitler. After he's conquering all of these countries and spreading his fascism and Nazism, what are you going to do? You have to stand up. That's what Allah is saying. وَلَوْلَا دَفْعُ اللَّهِ النَّاسَ بَعْضَهُمْ بِبَعْضٍ لَفَسَدَتِ الْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ ذُو فَضْلٍ عَلَى الْعَالَمِينَ But Allah is of great blessing or has given great blessings to the people that He allows war to fight against fasad. What is the reason people go to war in Islamic Sharia? To fight against zulm and fasad. Notice, zulimu and fasad, these are mentioned. And this is exactly what in any society is called a just war theory. You're allowed to go to war for certain causes. And we should not shy away from saying this, that yes, in our religion as well, we have something called jihad, and jihad is not what you think it to be. Jihad is a noble cause. It is a cause that of people who are persecuted, whose rights have been trampled, who are denied their basic freedoms. Yes, they have the right to fight back those who have oppressed them. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these verses and more after that. Abu Bakr radiallahu an said, when Allah revealed Surah Al-Hajj, and some people said, say that Surah Al-Hajj was revealed right in the very ends of Mecca, uh, Mecca era, and some say right in the beginning of Medina. Most say Hajj is a Mecca surah. So right at the very end, within a month or two of the Hijrah, Allah reveals a surah with some vague reference here. Abu Bakr said, as soon as I heard Surah Al-Hajj, I knew there would be war. Allah is referencing Qital. I knew there would be war, right? And of course, this would happen very soon after that. So, to summarize before we move on, the stages of jihad in, in the Prophet's uh, seerah, sallallahu alayhi wa are four. Four primary stages of jihad. Number one, military jihad has been forbidden. And the jihad is the jihad of the nafs and the soul. Be patient, turn the other cheek, forgive them, or accept their fate with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will take care of them, right? Inna kafaynaka al-mustahzi'in. Don't worry, Allah will take care of those who mock you, right? You do your job, we'll do ours. You teach and preach, we'll take care of punishing if they deserve it, right? So this is the first stage and it lasted all 13 years of Mecca. No military jihad. The second is that Permission is given, but it is not made obligatory. Permission. And so in the beginning, jihad was volunteer basis. The Prophet would ask for volunteers. And this was immediately after the hijrah. The third stage, jihad became wajib. And it became wajib against the Quraysh only. Not against the other tribes. And this was the bulk of the Prophet ﷺ's seerah. And then in the final stage, the Prophet ﷺ engaged in jihad against all of the polytheists of Arabia. And this is when he said, I have been commanded to fight the people, meaning the Arabs of my time, until they all testify to La ilaha illallah. So jihad became against the entire peninsula, and of course the entire peninsula then accepted uh, Islam. So these are the four stages of jihad. Number one, no jihad. Number two, permission given for military jihad. Number three, jihad is wajib against the Quraysh. Number four, and right at the end, jihad is wajib against all of the people of the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, after this, the scholars differed, is this commandment still applicable? And this is a theoretical issue. In our times, uh, no major scholar is discussing the issue. And for most of the Ummah's history, after the time of the Umayyads, ba basically since the time of the Abbasids, the Muslim Khulafa, by and large, have not been engaged in war with other nations. By and large, uh, the Islamic conquest took place in the first 150 years. Right? What Muslims conquered in the first 100 or 150 years is where Islam stands to this day, by and large, with some exceptions, small exceptions. But overall, the geography of Islam is the geography of the first 100, 150 years. Right? And this shows us that for the bulk of the history of the Ummah, 
People did not interpret jihad to be an all-out war against all of mankind. They understood that there is a time and a place, and there's a need, and then we'll engage in jihad. When there is no need, no need, there's no reason to engage in jihad. This therefore, as we said, let's move on back to the seerah, began the first of a series of expeditions that the Prophet wasallam and the Sahaba engaged in. And there were many reasons for these expeditions. They had some specific goals. First and foremost, the main goal was to show to the Quraysh that the Muslims had not fled weakly and without any power. But rather, they had fled and they're now going to fight back and gain what the Quraysh had taken from them. To illustrate and establish that the Quraysh are, uh, sorry, that the Muslims are an independent political and military force. And the first uh, expeditions, all of them, for the first few years, basically all the way up until Khandaq, up until Ahzab, it was only the Quraysh, as we said. The Muslims only targeted the Quraysh. No other Arab tribes are targeted unless they attack. No other tribe is, is just the Quraysh. So the Quraysh are being told, the Muslims haven't run away like cowards. No, we're going to fight back for what you have done to us. The second main reason is to cut off the oxygen supply of the Quraysh. The Quraysh are living in the desert. Where do they get their oxygen from? Not the oxygen of the air, the oxygen of money. Where do they get it from? Rihlat al shita wa saif Without this linkage, the Quraysh would have collapsed. Remember we talked about this, when they rediscovered Zamzam and they reinstituted, this is what brought Izza to the Quraysh. This is what brought economic prosperity and made Mecca the center of the entire Arabian Peninsula. Rihlat al-Shita was saif So the Prophet wanted to attack both the Rihlat al-Shita and the Rihlat al-Saif. Right? Both of them. Go up north and down south. Up north to the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire, and down south to Syria. Now, up north, uh, south to, uh, to Yemen. Up north, up north to go to Syria, they had to pass right by Medina. Medina is literally due north of Mecca. Literally. Look at it on a map. It's literally due north. And to get to Rome, or they wouldn't actually go to Rome, they would go to a city called Basra. I mentioned this before. Not Basra. Basra is they made it in Iraq. The Muslims made it in Iraq. This is that they took the name from this. The original name is uh, Basra. And Basra was a Roman city which is outside of Damascus. Outside. And the Arabs would typically go right to the tip of the Byzantine Empire which is Basra. And they would then buy and sell there. And Basra, I said before, to this day, the city of Basra is not uh, uh, that city anymore. But there is still the ruins of the trading places that made Basra famous. The same trading places that the Quraysh would have gone to, the same trading places are still there, the ruins are still there. It was an international uh, route, if you like. So they wanted to cut off the lifeline, especially the lifeline going to uh, Syria, but they also attempted Yemen, as we're going to come to. They also attempted Yemen, which is the exact opposite. But this shows you the strategy of the Prophet ﷺ. Another reason of sending out these expeditions is to increase the size of the Islamic State, if you like, right? To make treaties with neighboring tribes as they go out to convert or to make treaties with the tribes, so to make the Islamic new state larger and larger. And this is something that happened clearly in the Battle of Badr and the Battle of Uhud, uh, Medina expanded in its size. Because neighboring tribes form alliances, so you become larger and larger, and this is all the goal of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, uh, the scholars of Sirah mention two types of military expeditions. The first of them is called the Ghazwa, and the second is called Sariya. And these are two terms we need to know. Ghazwa and Sariya. Ghazwa is any military expedition that the Prophet himself accompanied. And of course, it goes without saying, anytime he accompanied, he's the commander. This is called the Ghazwa. A Sariya, Ghazwa is typically translated as war or battle. A Sariya is typically translated as expedition. A Sariya is something that he commanded the Sahaba to go on, but he did not accompany. Now obviously, the ones he accompanied are more important for us, obviously, right? Even though they're all important, but the ones that he accompanied are more talked about in history, and these are the ones we're familiar with, Badr and Uhud and Khandaq, these are the ones we hear about. But the Saraya, the plural of Sariya is Saraya, the Saraya are very, very uh, many. How many Ghazwat and how many Saraya? Well, 
a number of opinions. In Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, Zayd ibn Arqam, the famous Sahabi, narrated, Ghaza Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam tis'ata ashara ghazwatan. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam participated in 19 ghazwas. Wa annahu hajja ba'da ma hajara hajjatan wahida. And he only did one hajj. So, Zayd ibn Arqam said he performed 19 military expeditions and he performed one hajj. Uh, Buraida, another Sahabi, also reported in Sahih Muslim, says uh, that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, participated in tis'ata ashara ghazwa, 19 ghazwas, qatala fi thamanin minhun. He fought in only eight of them, so the rest didn't actually end up in a battle. He participated, but there was no blood, or there was no battle. For whatever reason, either a truce, truce or the two sides never met. Right? They ran away or something, so there was no actual war. He fought in eight of them. So this shows that there are uh, eight that are of particular importance. What are these eight? Uh, there's a little bit of ikhtilaf, depends on how you want to count the ghazawat. Uh, there's a little bit of ikhtilaf, but for example, Badr and Uhud and Ahzab are always included. Badr, Uhud and Ahzab are always included. Uh, some have Ghazwat al Muraisir, uh, which is uh, what happened with the story of the Ifq of Aisha on the way back from Muraisir. This occurred. Some have this as number four Ghazwat al Qadid, and then Khaybar and Makkah and Hunayn. This is one list from one of the Sahaba. I'll repeat Badr, Uhud, Ahzab, al Muraisir, Qadid, Khaybar, Makkah, and Hunayn. Right, the Ghazwat of Mecca, the Ghazwat of Hunayn. This is one list. Another Sahabi gave another list, and it's almost similar, but substituting a few. Badr, Uhud, Ahzab is the same. Instead of Muraisi, he has Ban al Mustalaq, which occurred one month after that. Mustalaq, Khaybar, Mecca, Hunayn, and Ta'if. So he split up Hunayn and Ta'if into two. Because Hunayn and Ta'if occurred literally two days after each other. And so one Sahabi basically assumed them to be one war. And others split them up into two. The point is, every military participation the Prophet ﷺ engaged in, and actually there was a battle, we have a lot of details about. But the ones where there wasn't an actual battle, sometimes we just have a reference. We don't have a lot of details, right? As for the uh, saraya, these are more than can be counted. As for the saraya, these are more than can be counted, and there are so many that really the scholars don't really list all of them with many details. Sometimes they'll even just mention with one line, sometimes they won't even mention it. So for example, uh, one scholar mentions there were 24 saraya. Ibn Ishaq lists 30 of them. Al-Waqidi lists 48 of them. Ibn Al-Jawzi lists 56 of them. So it depends on how you want to constitute. A saraya could even be three people going out to check out something, to spy. This is a type of saraya. Right, Sariya. This is a type of Sariya. So how many are there? Definitely around 30, 40 or so we can say, right? Military expeditions that the Prophet ﷺ commanded, but he himself did not uh, participate in. It appears that the first military expedition was that of Al-Abwa. It is called the, the, the expedition of Al-Abwa. And this took place on the 12th of Safar, in the second year of the Hijrah, i.e., nine or ten months after the immigration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In this uh, battle of Abwa, the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi heard of an expedition of the Quraysh, a, not a military expedition, but a caravan. And uh, they went out, but they couldn't get to it in time. So there was no actual battle. However, what happened was the first of many alliances were formed. So the Quraysh, uh, sorry, the Prophet Sallallahu made an alliance with the local tribes around Medina. They're called the Banu Damra. And so for the first time, the Muslim Ummah expanded. Right. So then the, the Sariya has the, exp the purpose of expanding the Islamic State. There was no military battle, but the, the military state reached uh, a level that was another 100 miles outside of the city. Right? So we're getting the independent state, the beginnings of an independent Islamic state. The second uh, battle that took place was the first time an arrow was thrown in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is called the first arrow fi sabilillah. And because of this, it is mentioned by great pride by the one who did it, even though, again, not a lot of blood, uh, no actual fighting occurred, but some arrows were uh, passed back and forth. And then a neutral party came in and basically uh, caused a type of truce, and the Quraysh went their way, and the Muslims went that, their, that way. And uh, this uh, Sariya is called the Sariya of Ubaidullah ibn al-Harith, and the first person to throw that arrow 
was Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. And he was very proud of this. And he kept on saying this, and he deserves to be proud, that I was the first person to throw or to shoot an arrow, I should say in English, to shoot an arrow, fi sabilillahi ta'ala. It took place in this expedition, again, within the first year of the uh, hijrah. But no blood was shed. Some arrows were thrown, and then an intermediate tribe uh, basically seized, call, called for a ceasefire, and then that tribe formed an alliance with the Muslims. So once again, the purpose then, uh, in the wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal, more tribes are embracing, if not Islam, at least the political state of Islam. What does it mean, embracing the political state? They write an agreement and contract that they will not support the Quraysh, that if the Quraysh come, they will inform the, the Prophet Sallallahu and this of course makes them a part of the Islamic, uh, if you like, empire or the Islamic state. The first uh, battle of significance, even though no blood was actually shed, but it has a lot of significance, as we'll talk about now, is called the Ghazwatul Ushayra. Ghazwatul Ushayra. The Ghazwatul Ushayra, the Prophet ﷺ took around 150, some say 200 companions to attack the mother of all caravans. This is the annual caravan that is going up to Syria. Right? This is not a small caravan. This is the mother of all caravans, which has at least 70 or 80 camels. It has on it perhaps 70 to 80 percent of the wealth of the people of Mecca. Because anybody who has any money in Mecca, what do they do? They invest in this caravan. Right? Even if you're a woman, like Khadija used to do, you would invest in this caravan. That's your only way of making money. I mean, you have this or nothing. This is the main source of money, is to invest in this caravan, to purchase some goods, send it to Syria, and get the money back, send it to Yemen, get the money back, and this is how they get richer, as being the middlemen between the trades and the goods up north, and the trades and the goods down south. So, of course, who was the leader of the caravan from Mecca? We should all know. Abu Sufyan, right? Uh, how do you know this? Actually, I forgot to tell you. So, Ghazwatul Ushayra was stage one of Badr. Because the Prophet wanted to catch the caravan as it's going up. However, Qaddar Allah, they weren't able to cross paths. They were not able to uh, cross paths. Uh, some say, some say that uh, it was a stroke of luck, even though of course anything is luck, Allah's Qadr. Some stray that say that one of the uh, uh, envoys, not the envoys, one of the uh, people of the caravan accidentally strayed and he happened to see the Muslims from the distance coming. So he rushed back and so Abu Sufyan hastily went a way that otherwise he would not have gone. Right? Uh, everything, you know, uh, everything is from Qadr of Allah and so Allah Azza wa willed this to happen. That Abu Sufyan hears of the Prophet coming and so he immediately diverts the caravan until uh, when the Prophet gets where he's supposed to be because of course they have just like a highway, right? If you're going from Memphis to Nashville, there is one way to go. Now we don't realize that just because there was no physical highway, there was still a highway of the, of the earth. A highway that people understood. That there were small settlements to cater to uh, the pilgrims that, or to the, the, the travelers. There was even uh, posts where you could buy or sell food and drink and water. Just like you have now gas stations and whatnot. Highways are always, human history have always had them. So there was a main road, if you like. Not a physical road, but a road that was taken. So Abu Sufyan heard of this, he would have been on that road. But Allah Azza wa Jal willed, not now. There's a bigger plan, a better plan. We'll get all of your big shots out and then get rid of you, right? Allah had a different, يعني, wa makar wa makar Allah. So Abu Sufyan managed to escape. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came back and uh, he did not know that Abu Sufyan knew. He, the assumption was maybe we're a day early or a day, remember this is, what do you have? GPS tracking, what do you have? Nothing, right? He did not know that Abu Sufyan knew that he had come. And so, when Abu Sufyan heard, and he is a very intelligent person, he is a Sahabi in the end of the day, we praise him, at this point he's not, but he accepts Islam. And there was leadership in his blood, after all he is really the blood of the Umayyad dynasty is Abu Sufyan, isn't it, right? The guy is a politician, and I say this in a positive way, he knows, I can't come back, you know, unprepared. So Abu Sufyan sends an envoy, he sends a crier back to Mecca, Right? Making sure that they are prepared for him on the return journey. And this was the setup for the Battle of Badr. That the Prophet and the Sahaba are completely surprised. An army? Where did this come from? 
right? They're not expecting an army. How did the army get there? Abu Sufyan was thinking 10 steps ahead. And he sent a crier, we're going to talk about that when we get there, with false stories, exaggerations. He told the crier to brush himself up. He caused himself to bleed. He tore his clothes up. And he's basically causing frantic, you know, uh, chaos. So you better do something right now, right? And so uh, they went berserk, literally. They, 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 they went, they gathered the largest army the Quraysh had ever seen. And we'll talk about whether we're jumping the gun. But Ghazwatul Ushayra is stage one of Badr. On the way up, Ghazwatul Ushayra. Nothing actually happens. On the way down, Ghazwatul Badr in Al-Kubra. There is another Ghazwa, it's actually called Ghazwatul Badr in Al-Sughra. Not to be confused with stage one of Ghazwatul Badr, which is Ghazwatul Ushayra. Ghazwatul Badr in Al-Sughra, or sometimes called Al Badr in Al-Ula, it's called Badr because it took place on the plains of Badr. But it was not with the Quraysh themselves. It was with one of the allies of the Quraysh. And what happened was one of these allies of the Quraysh, they struck Medina in the middle of the night like uh, cowards and they killed uh, one or two uh, camel herders, Muslims, and they stole some camels. It was a, uh, what are you going to call it? It's not a military raid, but it's a, what's the good word here? Huh? Ambush. Uh, ambush is what I'm looking for. It's an ambush. It's an ambush. It's not a military expedition. It's an ambush that you just. T it's not meant to kill people. It's meant to get the camels, right? And if one or two people die, that's you know that's what the. It, it's not a, a military all out. It's simply to get uh, an ambush to uh, very close to highway robbery, except that it's being taking place in your home, basically, right? It's a stealing expedition. Um, this expedition, the Prophet as soon as he found out, he gathered 70 of the Muhajirun and he also accompanied them. And this was the first time that they reached the plain of Badr. That's why it's called the first Badr. But it has nothing to do with Badr because it's not with the Quraysh and, and no, uh, no uh, military encampment occurred. Because the people who ambushed were literally four or five in number and the Muslims were much larger, they were much faster. And they managed to flee the scene. And so the Prophet was not able to capture him at this point in time. And this shows us that subhanAllah, even being the Prophet of Allah, Allah didn't just gift him with miracles after miracles. Allah didn't just allow every expedition to be successful. No. Some of them he came back empty handed. Because there's a lesson to be learned even in this. Because there are other wisdoms that you might not understand. We might not understand. But Allah Azza plan is infinitely wise. The main uh, incident we'll talk about uh, today it's a really interesting incident because of which Allah revealed Quran that we recite to this day. Uh, and by the way, one of the, uh, one of the consequences of the first battle of Badr was that the Prophet decided that he needed to have monitors or spies monitoring the tracks of the Quraysh and the allies of the Quraysh, right? And so for the first time he began sending out, we would call them reconnaissance missions. Right? Figuring out what the Quraysh are doing. And he sent out a group of people just to see what's happening with the trip to Yemen. Even though Yemen is on the other side, of course, it's on the southern point of Mecca. Yemen is on the opposite side, but just to get bearings. Is it possible? What can we do? Because, of course, an attack on the Yemeni side would take them completely by surprise. They would never expect the Muslims to double back and go around Mecca and then come and try to attack them from Yemen, the direction of Yemen. Now, interestingly enough, no attack of the Muslims actually took place. But the Prophet is not ruling it out. Look at this, right? He's not ruling it out. He's keeping all options on the table. That he sends out a reconnaissance expedition to see what's happening with the Yemeni caravan. If he's missed the Syrian caravan, let's get the Yemeni caravan. And so, this is now called Sariyatul Nakhla. As a consequence of the first battle of Badr, the Prophet is sending out reconnaissance, spy missions, and so the Sariyatul Nakhla takes place. The Sariyatul Nakhla took place in the month of Rajab of the second year of the Hijrah. The month of Rajab of the second year of the Hijrah. And the Prophet wasallam chose eight of the Ansar, hand-picked them. Usually before this time he would ask for volunteers. For this one he hand-picked eight of the Muhajirun, not Ansar, excuse me. Eight of the Muhajirun, no Ansar. He hand-picked Eight of the Muhajirun, none of the Ansar. And by the way, every single expedition as of yet, zero Ansar. I will talk about this in the end of today. Why? Every single expedition, Ghazwa and Sariya, all of them are pure Muhajirun. 
There's not a single Ansari taking place. And we'll talk about this in a while. And he put them under the leadership of his cousin, Abdullah bin Jahsh. Abdullah bin Jahsh is his cousin. And he gave him a letter. And he sent him basically northeast. And he said, travel for two days. And then on the morning of the second day, open my letter and read it. So they left Medina, traveling in the opposite direction of Mecca. Right? Not exactly north, but basically, yeah, and you're going to have to curve back. And that was the goal of the process. That they travel to a distance that it looks like they're going away from the direction of Medina. After two days, he obeyed the process and he opened up the letter. The Prophet ﷺ said to him in the letter, When this letter of mine is read to you, when you read this letter, proceed to Nakhla. Nakhla is basically on the uh, eastern side of Mecca towards Ta'if. Towards Ta'if. Proceed to Nakhla, which is you're going to have to double back and go down. And that was the point. The Prophet sent him this way to go back down. Right? So go all the way back to uh, Nakhla and watch the movements of the Quraysh and inform us of their preparations and actions. And do not force any of your inhabit or any of your companions to go. Whoever wants to come back can come back to Medina. Now, why this uh, strange letter? Many reasons. Firstly, so that it is utmost secrecy. Not even the people knew where they were going. Forget the people of Medina. Not even the eight people knew where they were going. Right? Secondly, and of course this is the illusion. He sent them up and the point is to go down. He sent them northeast and they have to go down south. Right? Uh, and that's what the Prophet said. al harbu khid'ah. Right? In a war you have to have these types of tactics. Treachery or not treachery, sorry. Deceit, not treachery, astaghfirullah. Treachery is not as haram. Uh, even in war, treachery is haram. But deceit, deception. This is, isn't, doesn't Sun Tzu say, the very first. Deception is, what is it? Deception is the art of war, what is it? Sun Tzu says this in the famous uh, book that he has 2,000, 3,000 years ago. The first maxim, deception is nine-tenths of war, something like this. He's, he's, the same thing, al harbu khid'ah, is that when you fight people, you need to have uh, these types of tactics. That's where you're not going to wage a battle any other way. So, this is the, one of the points. Another point, why is he giving them permission to come back? Well, because they are literally walking into enemy territory. Unarmed and defenseless. They're literally walking straight back into Mecca, basically. And they're being told to monitor the people of Mecca and tell the Prophet ﷺ what they're doing. So they're going to have to live there for a few days outside. Right, they're going to have to see what's going on. And who knows who can see them, who can capture them. And they are defenseless, meaning eight people against a city. Come on, you know, even if they have weapons, it's not going to really benefit them that much. So when Abdullah bin Jash read the letter, he told his companions that whoever wants shahada and is eager to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let him come with me. Because he thought, khalas, there's no way I'm coming back. Right? And whoever doesn't may go back to Medina. But as for me, I am going to proceed onwards to Mecca. Literally, look at his philosophy. Like he's literally thinking, there is no way this is going to be successful. But if the Prophet wants it, khalas, so be it. And of course, the, the, the Qadr of Allah, all of them came back. The Qadr of Allah. But at that point in time, he, thoughts, he thinks, khalas, there is no way I'm going to come back alive. So he said, whoever wants shahada, let him come with me. And whoever wants to go back to Medina, let them go back. What do you think the eight of them did? Obviously, they're sahaba. that's why they're the Sahaba. Not a single one of them returned back. They all went back. And uh, they had four camels. So every two people to a camel. By the way, in the early periods of Mecca, never was there one camel per person. Never. In most expeditions, there was three people to a camel. In most expeditions, three people in Medina. Three people had to share a camel. Never was there one person per camel. They didn't have that much. They not even one person per horse. They didn't have that luxury. The Quraysh tried to do it in, in Badr. But the Muslims couldn't do it. The Quraysh tried to do it. One man and one horse. 
But they could, the Muslims could not do that. At least, because they had, of course, they had a fleet of horses, they had uh, a steed of horses, sorry, and they, had, uh, and they had a group of archers, so they had an entire contingent, one person per horse. But the Muslims couldn't, didn't have that. They never, in fact, throughout the life of the Prophet ﷺ, they never had one man, one animal, subhanAllah, never. This was only afterwards in the Umayyad time, when money came in, was this, of course, we take it for granted, but wallahi, we don't think the Sahaba didn't even have an animal to ride on, that is their own. So even in this ghazwa, eight men and two, uh, and four, uh, two people per, per camel, four camels are being shared by eight people. On the way there, camels are notorious creatures. Camels are very independent, unlike uh, uh, horses are very docile. Camels are very stubborn and arrogant creatures, and they don't need men. Whereas horses and sheep, they need men to live. Horses cannot live in the desert by themselves. Camels don't need men. So what happens one morning they wake up, and a camel is missing. He's broken his uh, tether and he's run away, right? The camel is me. That's the famous hadith, should I tie my camel or should I tawakkal ala Allah? You need to tie your camel, right? They tied the camel, it still broke away. And it happened to be the camel of Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas and Utbah ibn Ghazwan, right? Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, the same one who's the first arrow thrower. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas, one of the 10 people promised paradise. Sa'd is one of the big guys, Sa'd ibn Abi Waqqas. So his camel and Utbah ibn Ghazwan, their camel is missing. What to do? Sa'ad and Utbah insisted, you guys go ahead, leave us in the desert, and we'll try to find our way or find our camel, you ca the expedition must go on, right? And this is the process I'm ordering, so that's what they did. They left the two there, and they didn't know what's going to happen to them. They don't even have a camel in the middle of the desert, but the expedition must go on. And so Sa'ad and Utbah are left, basically, to find their camel or to figure out another means to meet them or to go back to Medina. They don't know what's going to happen. So, six people then actually get to uh, Nakhla. And Nakhla is a small, uh, literally like a small group of desert uh, palms, if you look, date palms right there, outside of Mecca. That's why it's called Nakhla. Nakhla is just a small encampment over there. And uh, when they got there, they arrived at Nakhla, on the 30th of Rajab, the last day of Rajab, on the 30th of Rajab, and before even they set up camp, before they could put a tent somewhere in the desert and set up their reconnaissance efforts, they saw in the distance a caravan coming. And they hid themselves waiting to see what this caravan was. And it turned out to be one of the smaller business caravans of the Quraysh coming back early from the trade, and it is loaded with merchandise. Complete to the top. Spices and raisins and goods from all of these goods up to the top. And it does not have any uh, military protection. Just a few, you know, camel herders bringing it along. Because they were so sure that they're now coming at a time when nobody can attack them. The Prophet is not going to attack them now, right? And so, they began discussing amongst themselves, what should we do? Should we get all of this booty so easily? We're six of us, there's only a few of them, three or four, and there's a whole bunch of camels. The books don't mention how many camels. We can assume probably around eight or nine camels, probably around three men, right? Basically, it's a fortune because a camel can carry how many hundreds of pounds? It's a fortune that they can literally just get because they're six armed men and they have, of course, surprise. They have the, the, the advantage of surprise. What's the problem? Why can't they do this? Two things. Number one, the Prophet ﷺ told them to get information. He didn't prohibit them from fighting, by the way. He didn't say don't fight. But the purpose was information. And obviously, if they get this, they're going to have to go back immediately. Right? But this is a lot of money. It's a fortune. And of course, it's not going to be for them. It's going to be for the Ummah, right? It's not, it's not that they're benefiting, it will go back to uh, the state. And, and of course, the division of the wars, booty wars, of course, have not been revealed till Badr. Right? And so there's no personal motivation of greed here. The Sahaba don't even know that they're going to get a share. This, that was revealed in Badr. Now, right now, there is no concept of them getting rich, it's the state getting rich. So they were never accused of greed over here. This is for the state. So they're wondering, the Prophet didn't tell us to attack. He told us to look. Number two, the bigger problem than this was it's the 30th of Rajab. So what if it's 30th of Rajab? It's the sacred month. 
is the sacred month. And, of course, the sacred month, you're not supposed to fight. You're not supposed to fight. And what makes it so difficult is that there is literally an hour or two left for Maghrib. And after Maghrib is going to be what? Sha'ban. Right? Literally. But within those hour or two, they're going to pass through Nakhla and they're going to be almost in distance of Mecca. Yani, wallahi, it's literally Allah is setting this up. There's a reason. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because had it been any other time, it would not have been problematic. The problem comes, you know how it goes when you just have this close, right? It kind of whets your appetite. It kind of makes it even more difficult. And so they began discussing one another what exactly is to be done. And they said, if we wait till the sun sets, they will have basically, and he lost, we, we would have lost, they would have entered. And if we fight them now, well then we're going to be guilty of fighting them in the sacred months. Right? We're between two situations. What exactly are we going to do? Eventually, they decided they have the opportunity now. And by the way, up until this point, the Muslims have not been successful with any major uh, capture. Right? And so they really thought they're getting the prize. They really thought we have now a fortune, eight, nine camels loaded with spices and good and whatnot. This is a lot of benefit and blessings for, uh, for uh, the Prophet and the Muslims. So they decided, khalas, yalla, bismillah, let's go and do it. So they, they, they went and uh, attacked. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, herdsmen or one of the, the camel drivers was killed. Two of them they actually managed to capture and take as prisoners of war. And a lot of people think the first prisoners of war at Badr, no. The first prisoners of war were in this battle. The first prisoners of war. They took them and as they came, they just went all the way back to Mecca. Right? So literally, Medina, what's wrong with me today? SubhanAllah. I'm getting confused between the two. Uh, they, they went back the same way without even setting up tents, SubhanAllah. Yani they didn't even set up the reconnaissance mission. They literally got there before they could open their tents. They see the camel, they get all of these merchandise and they go back to Medina. And Allah Azza wa Jalla had willed this. When the Prophet saw them come back with all of this and he heard what happened that you kill somebody, he realized this would be a very negative PR disaster. And he told them, I didn't command you to fight. I didn't tell you to do this. And he refused to accept any of this merchandise, any of this booty. He refused to accept it. And the Quraysh had a field trip with this. They spread across the entire peninsula. Look at these Muslims. Look at these people. They've contradicted the Sharia of Ibrahim. They went against the Ashur al Hurum. They shed the blood of an innocent person in the sacred months. And they made a very big brouhaha about this incident. And the Prophet Ibn Ishaq and others say he felt great stress because the criticism in its place was valid. In its place, the criticism was valid. That the Muslims shed blood in Ashur al-Hurum. And so the Prophet did not know what to do until, and even the Yehud became happy now. And we're beginning to see that the Yehud are not going to be appreciative of the Muslims. They became happy that they saw this tension between the Quraysh and, and the Muslims. And from the beginning, it's clear now that they're not going to be on the side of the uh, Muslims. And as the fitna gains momentum, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveals in the Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 217. Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 217, which we recite to this day, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الشَّهْرِ الْحَرَامِ قِتَالٍ فِيهِ They ask you about the sacred months and fighting in it. قُلْ Tell them the response. قِتَالٌ فِيهِ كَبِيرٌ Fighting in the sacred months is a major sin. The judgment comes down. Fighting in the sacred months is a major sin. But there's no full stop here. وَصَدٌ عَنْ سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ وَكُفْرٌ بِهِ وَالْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْهُ أَكْبَرُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ Wallahi, this is the height of eloquence. It's beautiful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala criticized the shedding of the blood. He did not sanction it. He did not approve it. And he gave a judgment that clearly shows that our Lord is a Lord who is Al-Haqq. And Allah Azza wa decrees with Haqq. 
The Muslims should not have shed that blood. And the Prophet did not command them to shed that blood. But then Allah criticizes the Quraysh. And who exactly do you think you are to be criticizing these people? While you have not just killed one person, you have saddun, you have prevented people from coming to the Baytul Haram. وَكُفْرٌ بِي And you have rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَإِخْرَاجُ أَهْلِهِ مِنْ And you have expelled people from Mecca. And you come and you criticize now? All of this akbaru عِنْدَ Allah. All of this is much worse in the eyes of Allah. وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَكْبَرُ مِنَ الْقَتِلِ And the fitna that you are causing, the trial, the tribulation, is far bigger than the blood that this person has shed. وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَكْبَرُ مِنَ الْقَتِلِ Right? And wallahi, this is, Ibn, Ibn al-Qayyim says, Ibn al-Qayyim comments on this verse, and he says, so Allah says in this verse, that the matter that you have criticized the Muslims for, is indeed a sin. It's a kabir, it's a big sin. But if it is so, then what you have done, of rejecting Allah, and of preventing people from coming to his house, and of expelling the Muslims who truly belong there, physically and spiritually, is yet a greater crime. And the shirk that you are upon, وَالْفِتْنَةُ uh, أَقْبِنْ وَالْقَتَلِ Ibn Abbas said the fitna here is shirk. Ibn Abbas said the fitna, Allah says, وَالْفِتْنَةُ أَشَدُّ or أَكْبَرُ مِنَ الْقَتِلِ Ibn Abbas said the fitna here is shirk. Now, it is true that uh, the fitna, one of the references is shirk, but also we can be more broad and say, Included in the fitna is the chaos, is the breaking up of the tribes, is the breaking up of the Muslims from their household. This is also a fitna. And Allah is saying this fitna and the shirk is worse than the shedding of blood. So Ibn Qayyim says the shirk that you are upon and the fitna that you have caused because of it is even greater in the sight of Allah than the crime of fighting in the sacred month. And this is, and uh, wallahi this verse is so beautiful, the i'rab or the grammatical analysis has confused scholars from the very beginning because it's a very, there's many clauses here, right? Uh, well, uh, that Allah Azza wa Jalla says, "Yes, aluna ka an al shahr al hamik qatal fi qul qatal fi hi kabirun wa sadun an sabil Allahi wa kufrun bihi wa ikhraju ahlihi minhu." It's a bit complicated, but the Arabs will understand what I'm talking about. That the atif and ma'atuf ali is very eloquent and it's very atypical. And Zamakhshari and uh, uh, many of the classical scholars. Uh, uh, Sahib al-Dur al-Masun and uh, Sahib al-Arab al-Quran, they all have long discussions about uh, the eloquence of how Allah Azza wa Jal phrased this. Because, well, anyway, that's a bit too, we cannot, it's almost impossible to do it in English, to, to, under, to explain the difficulty. In fact, there's even an academic paper in Western journals about the grammatical analysis of this verse, because it's so different than uh, other types of verses, and that's a whole different discussion. In any case, once this verse was revealed, the Prophet ﷺ then accepted the booty, accepted the, uh, the, 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 the booty, booty from the people who had returned, and he agreed to take the two prisoners of war, and he sent a message to them that send ransom for these two prisoners. Uh, but he said, we will not release these two prisoners until our two companions reach us safely. Which two companions? Sa'ad Sa and Utbah, because nobody knows where they are. Nobody knows where they are, no news from them. And it's a desert out there, it's a jungle out there, you never know what's going to happen. So he said, if those people are harmed, these people are going to be harmed. So these prisoners of war will also be hostages. Until our two come back safe and sound, then you may ransom them. And so, uh, in fact, Sa'ad and Utbah were never seen by the Quraysh. They, in fact, found their camel eventually. And after a week or two, they actually came back to Medina uh, after having found their camel. And so, eventually, uh, these two were released. And in fact, amazingly, one of them, Al-Hakim ibn Kaysan, uh, actually accepted Islam. And after the ransom was paid for him, he then return back to Medina to make sure that the ransom was in the hand of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is not the only time this has happened. Multiple times people have accepted Islam as prisoners of war, but only after the ransom came, because they wanted the money to be in the hands of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is the first example of many to come, including the brother of Khalid ibn al-Walid, right? The, the older brother of Khalid, the exact same thing happens, and including a number of prisoners of Badr, many of them the same thing, that only after the money came, 
Then their bonds are freed, they walk out and they walk back in and they accept Islam. And this became the first of many. Al-Hakam uh, ibn Kaysan, he also became a Muslim and uh, he died a shaheed in one of the battles uh, at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. To conclude and summarize, look at the infinite justice of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and who is better at judging than Allah? Who is better at judging than Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Wallahi what a difficult what a difficult judgment to do. What are you going to do? On the one hand, the Quraysh criticism is valid. But on the other hand, at the same time, look at the context. I mean, what, surely can be overlooked. But Allah Azza wa Jal did not exonerate, but He said, who are you to criticize? Who are you to say anything after you have done all that you have done? And this is the reality of the Sharia of Allah. There is infinite justice. And Allah Azza wa says, who is better than Allah as a judge? Uh, we also see, uh, look at how many expeditions and how many ghazwas and saraya that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam engaged in. And this shows us that even the Prophets of Allah, they will not be handed victory just like this. Even they need to go out and sacrifice their families, their loved ones, sacrifice themselves. The Prophet himself was injured. No victory comes with ease. No victory is just granted like this. One needs to show dedication, determination, perseverance, sincerity. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses even the prophets of Allah. How about those lesser than them? Also see that the Prophet would choose always his own immediate family to be the most dangerous. He chose Ubaidullah ibn al-Haritha uh, for one of the expeditions. He chose Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. We didn't talk about all of the early expeditions because time is limited here. He chose Hamza for another. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas is, uh, is the, the relative of his mother, Amina. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas comes from his uh, mother's side and that is his khal. And he chose him to be one of the leaders in yet another expedition. Abdullah ibn Jahsh, which is the expedition we just talked about, was his immediate cousin. The point being, nobody can accuse the Prophet ﷺ of putting his family out of harm's way. He puts them right center. He puts them right in front. Because the leader, the Prophet, any person has to sacrifice himself and his loved ones before he's going to sacrifice others. And that's why in the Ghazawat, the Prophet would be in the forefront. And in the Saraya, he sent his own relatives uh, to show the people nobody can accuse him of trying to protect his own family from the hardships of war. Notice as well, as I said, that there were no Ansar in the early expeditions. It was all the Muhajirun. And there are reasons for this. First and foremost, the Muhajirun should not be made to forget about Mecca. The Muhajirun should not just settle down and live luxurious lives in Medina, big, get big houses and get married as Jabin and others are getting married now. No, 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 no. You need to be remember, you have a home that has been taken away. You have people that have done zulm to you. And so the Muhajirun are always at the forefront. Also, of course, one of the main reasons why there are no Ansar is because of the second oath of Aqaba. The second oath of Aqaba, what did it say? It said, you shall protect me like you protect your family. There was no offensive condition or clause. There was no offensive clause that you will fight with me whenever I fight. No. And the Prophet ﷺ, therefore as a wise leader never pushed the Ansar. In the battle of Badr they volunteered. But when they volunteered and it turned out to be an army, what happens now? We're going to get there. But that's when the Ansar added their own condition. We'll talk about it when we get there, right? But in the battle of Badr, the Prophet ﷺ kept on saying, what do you think we should do? One Muhajir stood up, another Muhajir, a third Muhajir. But they're not getting the point. What do you think we should do? What do you think we should do? You... Until finally, Sa'd ibn Mu'ad stood up. And he said, لَعَلَّكَ تَقْصِدُنَا يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ I think you're intending us, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet remained silent, which is his approval. And then he said his famous statement, that فَوَاللَّهِ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Go wherever Allah tells you to go. Go and walk into the river and we'll go behind you. Go to Barak al-Ghimad, which is the Arabic expression. Go to Mars, go to any place and we will go right behind you. Wallahi, we will not say to you as the people of Musa said to Musa, اذهب أنت وربك فقاتلا إنها هنا قاعدون Go you and your Lord and fight. We're going to sit here. Rather we say, go you and your Lord and fight and we are fighting right behind you. This is Sa'id ibn Mu'adh, that Sahabi that the Prophet said when he died, اهتزم 
Arsh al-Rahman, that the throne of Allah Azza wa shook when they killed Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. This is Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh, that great Sahabi of the Ansar. But again, that was when they put the condition on themselves. The Prophet didn't impose it on them. And so right now, up until this point, it's only Ansar. Also, we, uh, Muhajirun, what's going on with me today? I don't know. I'm taking certain medications, so that's why maybe this is going on. As also the last day, huh? Uh, also, one of the uh, benefits... Vacation anxiety. Vacation anxiety or vacation happiness? <laughs> that's both. It's both. One of the benefits was that... Uh, in, this early, in this early stage, as we said, jihad was not obligatory. Jihad was voluntary. And every single expedition, volunteering. Even the eight that the Prophet ﷺ chose, this is the first time he chose them. Still, what did he tell them? If you want to go back, go back. Right? Again, this is tadrib. It's getting them conditioned. It's raising the bar. Uh, one of the important, uh, let's conclude with two points about non-Muslims and their critique. Non-Muslims criticize and distort this picture and accuse Astaghfirullah, our Prophet and the early Muslims of basically being Astaghfirullah highway robbers. And they say that the Prophet and the, and the early Muslims financed themselves off of highway robbery. And this is the case with all of the enemies of Allah Azza wa and the enemies of Islam that they take something and they then distort the truth in it. There's an element of truth and they distort it in a sinister manner. And they then read in what they want and then propagate it in an extremely negative manner. So they say, the Prophet ﷺ and the early Muslims, what were they doing? They were ransacking the caravans of the Quraysh. And this is highway robbery. This is exactly like Allah says that you're accusing them of this, but what are you doing? And you're ignoring the context. The Prophet ﷺ is not attacking any tribe other than the Quraysh. This is a very important point. All of the other transactions in, in Arabia are safe. He's not even saying anything. There is no problem. It's only the Quraysh. And subhanAllah, what is wrong with attacking people when they have done this to you? When they have killed you, confiscated your property and land, expelled you from your houses, tortured you for 13 years. Wallahi, this is the least that you can do back in return. Right? And as I said, if this nation attacked its government because of a raise of taxes on tea. And that's why they killed the British soldiers. And that's why they overturned ships of Her Majesty and His Majesty. Subhanallah. Wallahi, what? Yani double standards is this, right? After all that the Quraysh had done, now the Prophet ﷺ is getting back a fraction. And you want to read in something uh, sinister? This is the reality of those whose hearts are full of hatred, that they take these things and they distort them. And they ignore the entire context of what's happening. And this is exactly what's happening now. Um, where uh, Malcolm X has the famous statement, Malcolm X said, uh, if you listen to the media too much, you'll start believing that the oppressors are the terrorists and the terrorists are the oppressors. He said this back in the 60s, right? If you listen to the media too much, you're going to start believing that the oppressors are the terrorists and the terrorists are the oppressors, right? And this is, yani he said this 50 years ago, and this is, subhanAllah, so true even in our times. The little Palestinian kid throwing the stone, that's the oppressor. And the military tank in front of him, right, that is the oppressed. Ya Latif, subhanAllah. I mean, what mindset, you know, are you going to, but this is the reality of the world that we live in. We also uh, see the hypocrisy of the Quraysh, and the hypocrisy of all those who wish to oppose Allah and His Messenger, that they accuse the Muslims of a sin, which might be a sin. Might. It might even be a sin. But who are you to accuse anyone of anything? When the crimes you're guilty of, you cannot even compare them to what the Muslims have done. And wallahi, how true this is in the world that we live in now. Wallahi, how true this is. Yes, things happen that we all disagree with. Yes. Things happen of terrorism of one side versus the other. We all disagree with. But are you going to ignore where that's coming from? Are you going to ignore the context? Are you going to ignore the anger? Are you going to ignore your own dhulm and oppression that has caused people to do another minor type of dhulm and oppression? You're not going to fight terror with terror. And terrorism only leads to other terrorism. Just because a country does it doesn't mean it's not terrorism anymore. Throwing a bomb or doing things is all types of terrorism on innocent people. And when you kill, it's going to come back to you. Kama tadinu tudan, as you do, is going to come back to you. And wallahi, the exact same thing we find now, right? The irony of ironies, they accuse Muslims of being 
terrorists, and they ignore the policies that are taking place in the world that are the real policies of terrorism. And this is something, subhanAllah, so many people are talking about. Forget Muslims, read Noam Chomsky, read Chris Hedges, read Robert Fisk, read any of these journalists, and the chronicle after chronicle, read uh, Glenn Greenwald, these are the people, read them. Wallah, you Muslims, you should be familiar with these people. Don't let uh, the mainstream media teach you the news. Go to these people I have mentioned. They have websites, they have Twitter accounts, they have Facebooks. You should all be subscribed to these, listening and hearing what these people are saying. And again, I'll repeat some of these names, you should know them. Noam Chomsky, Chris Hedges, uh, what did I say? Glenn, Glenn Greenwald, Robert Fisk. These are the four I'll mention now. These are the most easiest accessible as well. Log on to Amazon, see some of their books. They have websites, they have Facebook pages. Read what the criticisms they give. None of them, none of them, accuse us of being the primary terrorists. None of them justifies these people's terrorism, yani the, the, the Muslim groups that are fanatical. Nobody justifies, but they're putting them into context. All of these are putting, just like Allah says here, that who are you to criticize when what you have done is all of this much? That's exactly the same point that we see happening in our times. Yes, those Muslims who kill innocent people are worthy of criticism. But wallahi, I cannot criticize them and ignore what caused them to do these deeds. It's not possible to do that. And the same thing is what Allah Azza wa Jalla is teaching us. Yes, we criticize. Yes, aruna qul qitalun fihi kabir. What they're doing is wrong. They shouldn't be doing this. But Allah tells us, are you going to ignore what caused it? Are you going to ignore the context? This is a very important lesson for us to learn from in the modern world that we live in. The hypocrisy of the powers, the hypocrisy of the Quraysh of the past and the modern powers of our times. We learn from this and insha'Allah ta'ala we don't fall into the mistake of either of these uh, extremists that we fall into. We speak the truth, whatever the truth is, even if it's against us, we will speak it. And if it is against others, we will also uh, speak it. So all of these minor expeditions and the Ghazawat, minor as of yet, are going to lead up to the big one and the biggest and the first encounter and the encounter where the table was completely turned one of the biggest miracles of history and of Islam and that is the famous battle of Badr Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called it Yawm al-Furqan the day of criterion the day that the truth was clear from the error the day that victory was granted to the Muslims a type of victory that was unprecedented and it was to have repercussions all the way down throughout Islamic history the stage is set for the battle of Badr and insha'Allah ta'ala the battle of Badr is something we will discuss uh, when we resume the seerah uh, inshallah after the month of Ramadan.